As a landscape photographer, I often get asked if, when I shoot landscape photographs, whether or not I bracket my sequence shots for a panorama, particularly if it's low light, such as before dawn, before the sunrise actually comes up and lights up the landscape, or perhaps after dusk when the sun's gone down. We all know from experience when we're out shooting that shadows will block up quite significantly if we don't have even lighting in our frame. I want to show you the power of camera raw in situations like this and how you really don't need to rely on bracketing your images hardly ever. Exposing more frames is often really it's just more work and it's a lot of bother for a small amount of gain. In landscape photography shooting in raw is so very important and that's the thing we need to keep in mind. And raw is so important, especially in these low light conditions that you will experience from time to time, as you have so much detail in the original files to work with, even though when you look at the back of the camera, all you see is blacks and deep shadow. My panorama today is a short sequence of four images. These were shot well before dawn on the Murray River in Echuca. Uh, which is a border town between Victoria and New South Wales in Australia. I photographed many angles and sequences on the banks of the river for over an hour until the sunlight flattened the colours and that lovely dawn light then just disappeared. There are lots of darker areas and shadows in this particular sequence of four images that I've brought up in a folder here for you. And I want to work on this short sequence today and show you that with a little know-how and knowing your tools in Photoshop intimately, you will find this image as with any other image that has lots of shadow and lots of black, it will come alive. It will vividly pop just the way that you might remember it when you are actually shooting the sequence. Taking our raw four files into Camera Raw, there they are along the bottom displayed. Click on select all, then head back and then collect, click on the merge to panorama. Once this image is merged, of course, we have the little window of the projection telling us whether it's spherical or cylindrical. And in most instances, I like spherical. I'm watching my boundary warp because I don't want too much sky and I don't want too much foreground in the water. So around 45-50%, we merge now, uh, save this uh, uh, file into our folder. And there we can see that once it comes back into the camera raw, before we open it, it's already done some of the work for us in the shadows, highlights and whites. We just need to tweak those some more so that we get our contrast just right how much exposure we need, remembering that it is pre-dawn light. Once we've got that, they're the most important things, the shadows, the highlights and the whites, along with our contrast and exposure. Then we can work on the color temperature. We can also work on how much vibrance we want, remembering that there are dawn colors in the sky and it's a combination of working these in camera raw and also working them in Photoshop proper we will be able to bring those beautiful warm colors out. So we're using the magentas, the reds, some oranges, yellows, and a touch of green, being very careful there with the green. Uh, look at our vibrancy again, and maybe also look at our sharpening, whether we need to change the color noise reduction or just the noise reduction. Once we've got that all right, we just finally might do a gradient from the top and the bottom. Now we know that there's cold light pre-dawn, so it's a question of how low we want that temperature in the blues and the tint. Once we've got that right, then we can swap round and do a second gradient in the water because we want shadow detail in the foreground so that our eyes are pulled into the center where all the light is. So we can adjust that as much or as little as we want with the exposure. And again, the color temperature Click that off. 
It looks pretty good. We know there's a few little shadows in the boats and in the trees. That will be fine when we get it into Photoshop. Right. So we've got it here and we can see straight away that it's quite cold because it is pre-dawn. So let's work our levels first, bringing our greys up towards the blacks so that there's more light flooding into the photograph. Remember what I said at the outset, that raw files have amazing amount of resolving power and we're able to bring most of that out even though the original file shows us that it's very, very dark. A little bit of magic here with our brush tool. Um, and of course, we can do as little or as much as we want. And if we've done too much, we can always go back into the opacity levels on our right hand side here and just drop them down a little bit. And if that's not enough, if we feel that we need to darken off one or two areas, we can just swap our, our color to black, which means then that uh, adjusting the opacity, we can wipe the shadow back in, just so that it looks balanced and so that it looks natural. Flatten that off. And I can see that we need to just tidy up a couple of spots here, those branches there. And these white boats over there on the right side are not looking good. And I don't use the clone tool much, but I'm going to here just to bring a few more trees in. I find that's a bit of an eye magnet over there on the edge. So just adjusting different areas. You can see that we can hide that and it looks more natural. It also focuses our eye across to the center and the left hand side of the image by getting rid of that highlight. So not much tidying up here, it's pretty good. I'm going to look at the color balance and the hue saturation. Here we go. Yellows, a lot more, because I want to tone it up how my eye saw it. Remember, the camera never captures how your eye sees it. So you always need to adjust pre-dawn and dusk photographs, particularly in dark light the way your eye sees it, which is totally different from the way your camera sees it. So we can uh, go to vivid light now. And this is just a, a matter of putting layer and layer in until you find that you have enough light, both in the sky. Here we go. And in the reflection of the sky, changing the uh, family of color to a nice warm tone. In this time in the... Uh, pink family because that sky was quite vivid to my eye but the camera has not been able to capture capture it as well and so I'm just going to wipe more in there just to make it glow see that's how I saw it the sun was coming up it hadn't yet reached the river but it was lighting up the sky now you can make this as strong as you want or as natural as you want it's just how your taste is with these uh, low light photographs. Again, I'm going back to the yellows and I'm just going to punch those up some more, flatten that off. Now I'm going to just tone up the, the uh, gradient a little bit more in the sky. I just want to darken that off a little bit. You see how that's now concentrating our eyes into the center of the photograph which is where the action is and those beautiful colors. All right, just a little bit more of the warm toning through the center here and watching our vivid light that we don't have it too strong. Can you see how now that's punching that up beautifully? So we've, we've created the levels of the color that we want in the sky and now we just do the details. Finally, I'm just going to make the uh, the size of the image the way I want it, which is always around 42 inches wide. And I'm going to do some structure here now, it, later, always later, we've already done it. A little bit of structure there 
in the photograph. That's way too much. Brighten it up a tiny bit. Tiny bit of contrast, back that off. Click OK. Now here's the magic. Because we've made a copy, we now can make a mask. We can fill that with black. And then with the brush, in the normal mode, and I would say not quite a hundred percent and just through the center where we want the structure. And again, if we've done it or we've overdone it, I should say, we can always go back into the opacity. Here we go. See, and just back that off a little bit. So we've done the structure, which brings out the detail where we want it. And then we've backed it off to how it looks just right. And there it is. Absolutely stunning. And the sun wasn't even up. The raw files you expose in most situations in landscape photography will be full of detail. But only if you really think about your process. I always err on the side of underexposure. Often exposing to the right of our histogram is not always the wisest choice. There is a fine line between correct exposure and overexposure. And you know, you cannot bring back details in your image if you do too much overexposure. Or even if you overexpose a little bit, some of those highlights, some of those details will be gone forever. I teach my workshop participants to think about exposure all the time. It's after shooting the actual image, it's the most important thing you can think about. And that's why the exposure compensation button on all good cameras is right next to the shutter button because it's the second most important thing you can do. Don't be swayed by popular opinion. Don't expose to the right too much if you don't need to. Every situation calls for different nuances of how we work our settings on the camera every time we pick it up to shoot. Often it's taking a meter reading of our mid-tones but it will show up too dark on your display. Don't be fooled by that. And my advice is to experiment and record what works for you in low light conditions. I shoot so many low light landscapes and they work every time because I have a feel for that light. And you can too by honing your camera skills and keeping a record of what works and when. Thank you for watching.